Let's just quickly start with a short recap of the handout from last class. So uh, prior class you had this handout here um, for, four, for 4A. And I just wanted to quickly cover, there was a question on how to interpret these, these, this output. It shows up in the assignment. Um, this is, for me, the most important part of this course. So just to quickly recap here, we um, saw in the last class that we had three constraints. This is back to the soldering problem and placement and inspection. Uh, these three numbers here, 1,500, 1,000, and 500, those are the numbers from your right-hand side. So you had less than or equal to 1,500, less than or equal to 1,000, and less than or equal to 500. What the values between lower and upper tell you is how much you can move that resource constraint. Remember, this is a constraint that says you've only got this many minutes in this particular interpretation of the problem. That's minutes available at that station. And so this says that you can move between 750 and 1,068 and change that resource, and the optimum will still stay at the same location. The optimum is not going to shift. Your current x1 and x2 optimum variables, whatever they are, I forget the numbers. Um, oh, in fact, they're right here. x1 was uh, 62.5, and x2 was 31.25. That optimum will stay at that location, provided you move one variable at a time in that range. So you can go either increase or decrease placement between those bounds, increase or decrease inspection between those bounds, or increase or decrease the other constraint between those bounds. You can't do them all simultaneously, one at a time. We'll look at, in today's class, how to make two shifts or more at a time. But for now, the interpretation is this is one variable at a time that you can shift between those bounds. Okay, now the fact that placement has plus inf over there on the upper bound indicates that placement is not a limiting constraint. And we, we can actually see that quite nicely here. Placement down here is an inactive constraint. Its upper bound is 1,500. It's currently at 1,300. So it's not active. It's not lying against its constraint. And so it says that you can keep shifting that up and up and up however you like. It doesn't matter. It's, it's not active. So um, adding more time at the placement station is not really a fruitful um, use of resources. The two other stations, soldering and inspection, these are active. The upper level is 1,000 and the, it's currently at 1,000. The upper level is at 500 for the other one and it's currently at 500. We can also verify that because it's got a non-zero marginal value. So a zero marginal value is under a regular solution associated with an inactive constraint. An active constraint will have a marginal. A marginal tells you what is the improvement in the optimum for a one unit change. Now here's the key thing, right? You must be able to make that one unit change. Right now we're at a thousand, we can go up to a thousand and sixty-eight. Right? So if I take this from a thousand to a thousand and one, I'll get sixty-two point five cents improvement. But let's say my upper was at a thousand already, I can't go beyond that unless I resolve the problem, right? So this says what the, rain, the rate that the optimum will change for a one unit change, provided you can make that change. And in this particular example here on the slides, we can go make those changes because we have room to move. Yes, Joseph. The same set of constraints will be active. You'll, you'll make more money. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, no, you won't make more money because we're only affecting the resource here. Right? So x1 and x2 are still the same. We're not changing the objective function. But then wouldn't the solution be uh, with greater soldering? Like uh, on the bottom there, the marginal? Oh, wait, sorry. OK, I, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing what you're asking, yes. Uh, to get a visual for that, we'd have to go back to uh, 3B. Let's hand out. I'll just quickly pull it up here. Wait. 
Okay, so what we're talking about is taking soldering from its current line in black at 1,000 and moving it up to 1,068. It says that the optimum remains at this, at this intersection of points until you get beyond that blue line. But you can go as far as that blue line. But yes, yeah, you, your X1 and X2 production will change. It will change and vary along this black line over there that connects them. And the optimum will still be those two constraints? Will be that intersection. So what I mean by that is that your active set won't change. Your active set is still the set of constraints that intersect at that location. If you move beyond that point, your active su set switches to different variables, and then we can't tell anything. The whole point is that if we do it within that range, we can find out what our increased amount just from the marginal value. That's right. You d yeah, and we'll, we'll solve a problem like that now. OK, perfect. OK. So that's a, a recap of those important points from last class. Um, let's go back then to 4A, your, your uh, handout from last week. I think that's pretty much all I would like to recap for now. Um, what we did was we left that problem at the middle of page three. We ended off that topic, and I'd asked you to consider this problem down here. So this is, again, some more practice. We're going to see this a few more times um, before we move on. So a bit more practice with GAMS output. This is an entirely new problem. Middle of page three on your current handout. We haven't we haven't switched to the new handout yet. Why is the profit, what's the current zero? I'm gonna explain oh, okay. it. Yeah, okay. So this is an entirely new problem. You've not seen it before, and it's in fact a subset of a problem. Only to interpret the GAMS outputs. We're working on a distillation column over here. The distillation column, and I'm focusing on two constraints. There's a constraint on reflux that you can't go higher than 600 liters per hour. And the pump seven can flow between a minimum of 1,000 and a maximum of 2,000. So that's the, the nature of that pump. And when we solve with that particular set of constraints, our optimum value that's currently recorded here is a profit of zero. Um, that's, not, that's just because it's a, a, a hypothetical problem here. What I want to focus on is the interpretation of the marginals and of these ranges. Right? So the objective function doesn't particularly matter to us. What we want to understand is this question here. Our profit is currently at 0. What would the profit change to if we increased our reflux flow rate by 50 liters per hour? Okay. So take a minute and work through that. What is the effect on profit of changing the reflux flow rate by an additional 50 liters? You're adding to your existing optimum. Okay, so to answer that question, you'd need to answer these sub-questions. What is the current value for reflux? I have a few spare copies of the last handout if anyone needs. It's not a it's not a constraint that you can consider the range for. Yeah, but you, it's, it's a hypothetical, right? Yeah, it is zero, but you can't take it more than negative. Right, it's the coefficient in front of the non-negativity constraint. X1 greater than or equal to zero. There's a plus one in front of that. Yeah, for non-negativity. OK, so what's the current value of reflux flow at the optimum? 600 liters per hour. OK, we see that in the GAMS output. The current level for reflux is at 600. 
is it active or is it inactive, that constraint? It's active. The upper value is also 600, indicating it's act at that constraint. The fact that the marginal is non-negative also indicates to us, yes, it is at the limit or at the bound, and the marginal is non-zero. OK, so we can then go and investigate the effect on profit here using that marginal value. So we say then, um, of course, the effect on profit is assume we can actually move that reflux up to 650. So you might not be able to, right? You might not have the pumping capacity or the pipe might not be large enough. But that's exactly what these LPs are telling you is if you are able to do that, I mean, there's a reason why this constraint is at 600. You've obviously identified that as some limit. But what the marginals are telling you is what is the effect if you could go beyond that constraint limit, right? In other words, is it worth investigating this? If the effect, the marginal improvement is so small, it's not even worth considering this any further, right? You might have to go buy a larger pump or a larger pipe to do this. But this output is telling us, assume you can do that. What is your effect on profit? Any numbers? 187. OK. So 187, how is, how is that found? You can say, see it like this. Your marginal value is equal to uh, 3.74. And the marginal is defined as dp over delta b. Now. The bi that we're making a change by, delta bi, is equal to plus 50 in this particular instance. So your delta profit then is 3.74 times 50, which is $187. Okay, So that's a straightforward calculation. What about the decrease in reflux flow? The second question here is asking, what is the effect on profit if you decreased reflux by 50 liters per hour? OK. It's not negative 187, as you might be tempted to. Let's work through that. The current value for reflux is 600. Is it active? Yes, it is still active. Can we move the reflux down to? 550 this time. Yes, you probably can. You just close a valve in your pipe and throttle your flow down. So it's practically possible to do that. The marginal value is 3.74. Delta BI is equal to minus 50 this time. And before you just go sub in there, you must go check that it's within the range. It's currently at 600. The lower bound is 572, and a drop of 50 units takes you beyond that bound. So the best we can say is we can't tell the effect on profit for the entire change. But what we can do <coughs> is say, well, we can go make the change from, five, from 600 down to 572. So from 600 to 572. is a change of minus 20, what is it, 28 units. Okay, And so then the effect there is on delta P is equal to minus $104 at the very least. Okay, We can't tell what goes beyond that. Uh, to make the full change down all the way down to 550, we can't say what will happen after 572. But at the very least, we know that we're going to suffer some economic loss here, um, plus some more. There's definitely going to be some more negativity added to this, but we just can't tell how much from this software output. Yes, Niall. So the lower table tells you what's physically possible in the upper and lower 
uh, the upper part tells you what's physically possible. Right, so we can move that constraint from 600 liters per hour down to 572 up to 790 without resolving the problem. Yeah, so in linear programming, that's what's possible. The upper table tells you what's possible. The lower table tells you the effect of that change. The marginal values tell you the effect of that change. Oh, I thought you were referring to upper and lower. Okay, sorry. Yeah. The difference between the two upper and lower limits of the table. Between there and there? That's. I think, like, what, what, there's a lower and an upper bound from the marginal value oh, area. What okay. Are those? Oh, what are these lower and upper bound values? Okay, so this is your current level of your constraints, 600 liters per hour. It says that when you've defined it in GAMS, you've got an upper bound constraint of less than or equal to 600, and you've got a, you, you haven't put a non-negativity on here, so it's, it's got a inf negative infinity range. So you can, like we increased it to 650, but doesn't that, doesn't that um, break the marginal value? That, yeah, it does, but that's what I said is, we have to assume we can do it. Right, so you've got to have the physical resource to do it. You probably have put this constraint of 600 here because there's a reason for it. The pipe is a certain size, or the pump that's creating the reflux flow rate can only develop that much flow for you. But this is saying, should you be able to go up to 650 per hour, you'll get an additional profit. Then you can decide now if it's worth investing in that change to your process to, to get that profit. So the marginal value is the ones that we define Whereas the ones that are under equation name, those are ones that GAMS fits out no matter what we define as an upper. The, everything here in the box is from GAMS. Yeah. 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 So what's like, if say we can drop reflux by minus 50, what's like the disadvantage of just resolving the optimization problem? Nothing. You can just go resolve the optimization problem. Okay. Yeah. But in, we'll, you'll see is, is in, in typical LPs, these op op solutions can take several hours to, to happen, okay. right? So it's not always an easy thing to go do. Obviously, this is a tiny problem that takes milliseconds, okay. yeah. Okay. OK, so let's uh, get a little bit more uh, understanding of that table. Here's another question asking right at the top of the next page, what is the maximum allowable increase of plus infinity mean for the pump flow? So if we look back at the table there, it says plus infinity over here for the pump flow. What is the interpretation of that? Shell. So I mean, it's like if the pump flow increase pump flow to infinity, uh, you could still do that and have the marginal increase. Okay, so what's the marginal value for pump flow? Oh, it's nothing. It's nothing. Okay. It's, it's inactive, so uh, it has a non-zero slot, so you can't um, you can't do anything. Uh, no matter what you do, it won't affect the objective function. Okay, so the marginal value for this pump flow equation is zero. It indicates that that constraint is not active. And therefore, you can move it up wherever you like. Its current value is at 1,700. Your constraint is at 2,000. But it's indicating that there's no limit to how high you can take this. You could take it up to whatever value you'd like to take it up to. Or decrease? Or decrease, uh, Mark is asking, can, is there a limit to the decrease? Yes. Yeah. OK. So. You can decrease it down to 1,240 before the problem changes to a different active set. And you would have to go any, investigate any change beyond that. Yeah. Okay. What is the cost of taking it, say, down to 1,300 on your optimum? There's no cost, right? It's currently at 1,700, but you could bring it down to any number you like up to 1240 and it will cost you nothing to do that. Okay. So it won't affect your profits by doing that. Okay, so LP's readily interpretable. Here's another uh, one that adds to that discussion. If, if someone is proposing to increase the capacity of pump 7, what's your response to them? 
spend your money on something else. Yeah, okay. So maybe let's move on here now to this idea of making multiple changes. And to, to do so, we use this rule, it's called the 100% worst case rule, which applies for active constraints. So if we read these two bullet points, please make note, this is important, that these are for active constraints. So if you're making changes in more than one variable, and as long as the sum of your change is less than 100% in total, so the sum of those changes or the total of those changes is less than 100%, then the current active constraints will remain the same. Right? And in other words, you can go use that GAMS output. If you're making changes that sum up to more than 100%, you cannot use the GAMS output. You will have to resolve. So let's. Uh, Let's take a look at an example here. I've taken the previous output from GAMS and I've added a new variable, new constraint for pump five. Pump five's flow is restricted to 750 liters per hour. And you can see in the out GAMS output that it is in fact at that constraint. Pump five is at its upper bound of 750. It's got a non-zero marginal indicating it's active. The reflux constraint is still active as before. And the question now is we'd like to do two things. We'd like to increase both the reflux flow by 50 units. We looked on that board pr earlier just increasing reflux flow on its own. We'd like to make that change and reduce pump 5's flow by 40 units, both changes at the same time. So current reflux flow is 600, current value of pump 5 flow is 750. Let's understand how we make that change. So for reflux, we want to go make a 50 units change. 50 units corresponds to a shift of, take a look here, 790 to 600. Right? We're increasing reflux from its base value up by 50 units. So we're looking at the percentage move in this range from the current to the upper. Please note, this is not the percentage change from lower to upper, it's the percentage change from where you currently are to where you, the maximum you could go. We're moving up, so we look in that direction. So 790 minus 600 is a range of 190 units. We're moving 50 of those 190 units. That's a percentage 26. The pump five ch change is a decrease by 40 units. It's a decrease of 40 units from 750. We're currently active at 750. We'd like to make that change minus 40 units, minus 40 still is within the bounds from 750 to 640. And as a percentage change, it's 25, oh, please um, update that, it should be 40 divided by 108. Is 40 divided by 108 still 37? Yes. Okay, so it's just a typo there. Um, 37% plus 26% is less than 100, so we can go investigate the effect of those simultaneous changes on profit. What is this, the net effect then on profit? Um, shouldn't be infinite. <laughs> yeah, because wouldn't we want to increase the pump five flow to increase our profit? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it should be, it should have a value here. Yeah. 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 This is a created GAMS output to illustrate a problem. It's, yeah. Okay, so the net effect on profit is um, 50 units change at a marginal rate of 3.74 and a decrease in the pump flow leads to a marginal rate of 
we're changing it by 40 units, so 40 times 1.54. But because we're decreasing it, it's a negative. So it's the sum of those two values. So you increase profit on the one hand and decrease it on the other, and the net is Presumably, I, I chose one that's a positive sign and a negative sign to teach this idea that um, we're looking at one side of the range and the other side of the range. But presumably, you'd be making changes to improve profit um, in both instances and not necessarily trying to cancel profit out. But it does illustrate here that, importantly, when you're making that decrease, you still add up the, the, the percentage together, right? You don't this doesn't become negative 37%. You're making a change. And as long as the sum of these changes are remain below 100, you can do this. If the sum of the changes exceeds 100, the best you can do is resolve in GAMS. Does this apply when you were doing the previous examples? Um, yeah, but when we were moving the in the prior example, we were making 100% change or less. right? So you can go up to that range. So, so it's the same idea. OK, any questions on the idea of sensitivity? Okay. M plenty of examples coming up in uh, the next assignment. The TAs and I and I have been working on that. So that will be available for you on Friday to get a bit more practice with this critical aspect of interpreting LPs. OK, so let's move then to the newer handout that you have in front of you that's available here at the, in, the in the class. And what we're moving to here is this idea that I want to not just teach you linear programming. I want to teach you a broad application of linear programming. And to do that, we've already started to introduce terminology of supply, demand, minimizing costs, maximizing benefits. We've, ter we've t spoken about LPs in this generic language. What this next section does is it people have studied LPs to death since the 1950s, 1960s, when they really started to take off in, in companies. And what they noticed at, when studying LPs is that they belong in four general broad categories. So the nice thing about that is that if you understand an example problem from each one of these categories, you can generally get a good sense for most LPs out there. So we, we will do every one of these types of models will show up in assignments or in class. So let's take a look at the first type. It's an allocation model. And an allocation model is um, one that you're probably familiar with the idea where you're trying to take a resource and divide it up into competing needs. Now that resource can be anything that's of finite availability. So land, money, time, fuel, all of those things have a finite limit on them. And what we're going to do is we're going to have as our decision variables how much of each resource to allocate to which activity. So how much resource, we're going to split that resource out, is available to each activity. Remember, we'd use this term activity in the last class as a way to denote our xi terms. We said our xi's are our activities. That's the generic language we've been using for LPs. So you've got this finite resource, and you're splitting it up. Now, you're going to be absolutely sure when you set up this sort of problem that you're going to have an equation where the sum of your activities adds up to your resource, right? It's got to. Because you're taking a finite amount of something, land, for example, and you're splitting these pieces of land up into different activities. So that you guaranteed to have a constraint in here that's going to be something like the sum of xi is equal to whatever that resource quantity is. 
So here's an idea. The second example is you allocate land for timber, for grazing, or recreational use. So timber might be x1, how much is for grazing, for animals, for x2, and how much of that land is available for people to use, x3. x1 plus x2 plus x3 must equal to the total area of land. And these activities, timber, grazing, and recreational use, will bring in revenues for you. Right? So you can sell the wood, you can sell the, the grazing rights to farmers, and you can charge people to use your land for recreation. They'll each bring in revenues, and how do you split up that land to maximize your revenues is going to be an allocation problem. Did you follow have like diminishing returns on like, like why would you just allocate the most, all your land to most possible activities? Right, because there will be certain constraints. Because this is government allocating the land, they, they'll have a minimum amount that's used for forestry and not let it all go to grazing. Right? Or, or a country that obviously doesn't allow that will, will be cutting down all their trees. Right? And so there will be certain policies, i.e. constraints. Okay. If you're taking barrels of crude oil, you might have to decide to ship certain percentages of those barrels to different sites. Now each site, they, these are geographic locations, can make more or less value from that crude. And so you will send the crude to different sites to maximize your total value. Again here, certain sites might do really well at reforming naphtha, other sites will do well at cracking gasoline. And so you split up the, those barrels to those different sites. Concert tickets, um, you've all seen this, right? So certain tickets are freely available. Um, there's a minimum or a maximum amount that's freely available to the media. There's some tickets that are sold to students at a lower price, others that are sold to the general public at a higher price. And how do you allocate that resource, let's say 10,000 concert tickets, up into those categories so that you meet Supply, uh, you meet demand, but you also maximize your revenue. All right, so a concert that's extremely popular is not going to have student tickets available to, for it. If you want to fill up the seats, you can then have more available at a lower price. So these models, pricing models, are used by uh, companies to determine that sort of that allocation. Now the opposite of an allocation model is a blending model. So Allocate is you take something up and you split it. Blending model is you take stuff and you combine it. So they're mirror images of each other. And we'll look at blending models quite intensively. Um, that's where they often appear in chemical engineering. Petroleum is the classic example. In fact, was the reason why we have such good LP technology available is the big petroleum companies spent a ton of money investing in these linear programming solvers. So they drove a lot of the development behind it. Now, we have then in these sorts of models that our decisions are how much of each ingredient goes into the blend. Okay, so if you're looking at your decision variables is how much of each ingredient goes into the blend. Okay, so petroleum companies, how much um, of naphtha, gasoline, and crack gasoline do, goes in to the blend that makes the final uh, fuel that you ship? Steel companies, so you may not be aware of this, but ArcelorMittal here in, in the city, they use these sorts of models. They actually take them a little bit further. They look at what they've called an optimal steel purchasing policy, where they solve it models to define who they buy steel from so that they maximize their overall revenue. Take an example here is you have to decide how much steel to use from different suppliers. So you could ship steel in from different countries. Each supplier has a different composition. You've got supply constraints. So some suppliers can supply you a lot of steel. Other suppliers can do it only in small volumes. And you want to get a composition, a blend, that has the desired properties. Okay. Here's, a, here's one that we'll work through a steel example over the page, but let's work through this one here quickly, just to illustrate the sorts of constraints that you encounter. In a petroleum company blending X1 naphtha, X2 reformed gas, and X3 crack gasoline, they want a fuel with a minimum 
and maximum octane rating. So they'll typically specify a lower bound. So here, write out the constraint so that when you blend it, you get an octane value of at least 84. The octanes for naphtha are 80. Octane for ga reformed gas is 115. Crack gasoline is 105. <coughs> what does the constraint look like so that your blend has an octane of 84? Take a minute to figure that out or work with someone next to you to help you. What are you implicitly assuming when you write out that equation there in front of you? Okay. You have to make the assumption that blending is linear. Now, that's not always true, but for many processes, a linear, a linear combination makes sense. It doesn't make sense when things are reacting and changing, but as long as they're being blended in, in a, a linear way, that assumption is fair. So you could write, for example, 80 times x1 plus 115 times x2 plus 105 times x3. What does the right-hand side look like? No, that's wrong. multiplied by some of the x's. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Okay, you must have that summation there. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you set it up with some of the x's multiplied by the right hand side or divided by the left hand side. Okay. Great question. Does it matter if we set it up this way or if we bring it over to this side? OK, so the GAMS will have no problem interpreting this form of the constraint. But it's nonlinear. So you've now made your program unnecessarily nonlinear and much, much harder to solve by writing it in this form. Okay? So we will write it in the form that's up here. In fact, you'll probably write something like x1 plus x2 plus x3 is equal to x4 and then put that over there right so if you're writing this up in gams you'll break down your problem you'll define a new variable x4 which is the total uh, volume and then write your problem like this now in fact what gams will go do is internally it will rewrite that equation you could write it the way I have above, but GAMS will go internally and rewrite it as the following to get it in standard form. Okay. Next time you go to the computer lab or at home and you run GAMS, remember GAMS is freely available to you, just download it and you can run it at home. Take a look at the output. GAMS shows you how it rewrites the equations in standard form. And you'll see that if you type this in, it will rewrite it internally as that. Okay. So the key learning here, and I'll start to do this as we proceed through the course. I'll show you what is often called little tips and tricks in, the, in this um, area. They're not really 
tricks in any way. They're just more just thinking about the problem. But writing it up like this is tempting and easy to do, but will create a, an unnecessary complexity in solving your problem. OK, let's go and look at the Swedish steel example up on the next page. This is a, a, a blending problem. This is from the textbook by Rarden. And you're welcome to go download the GAMS code from his site over there. So this is an example from his textbook. And it's the classic blending problem where you're trying to create a blend of steel at minimum cost. Okay, so I haven't written the description of the problem up there. I'll just verbally say it. We're trying to create a blend of steel at minimum cost. Now, as we said, blending problems have their decision variables as being the amount of ingredients, right? I, we defined that earlier. So what are the decision variables in this case? You're trying to make this scrap, uh, you're trying to make this steel, I should say. That's your blend is your net result, is this blend of steel. And blending problems have by their nature the decision to make, to choose how much of each type of ingredients to go into the blend. So your decision variables would be something like x1 for scrap 1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x6, x7. Yeah. Okay, so simply would your decision variables then are kilograms would be kilograms of steel or scrap from each supplier. And your constraint then that your total steel or your total charge to the smelter um, remember, you'll, or you might not know, but you would purchase these steels in a combination and put them into your smelter, and apply heat, and your final charge needs to be 1,000 kilograms. So this constraint will be an equality constraint with x1 plus x2, x3, x4, x5, x6, x7 adds up to 1,000. So x1 all the way up to plus x7 equals 1,000. Now is this common with blending problems. We saw that with the octane as well. Give this one a, a go. Write out the constraints that the final nickel composition of the blend must be between 3 and 4%. Okay, so as we saw there with the octane example, you could create a new variable for the total charge, call it x8. And then when you want your composition of your final product to be between 3 and 4%, what sort of constraints would you land up with over there? Any suggestions for the nickel constraints? Yeah. 
Okay. So 18 times x1 plus 3.2 times x2 plus 100 times x5 must be less than or equal to? Uh, so the upper bound is 4. Okay. And then you do the same thing. Uh, four times x8. Okay. Four times x8. Or you could, obviously, you could simplify this and just sub in 1,000 right away. But it is more generic and better to probably work with it as a variable. But yeah, so that, and then you'll. Same on the left hand side. Greater than 3 times x8, OK? So you'd have upper and lower constraints for nickel. This problem quickly expands, and you get upper and lower constraints for carbon, for chromium, for molybdenum. So you land up with about 8 to 10 inequality constraints for every um, element that you're interested in. Okay. How do you code the availability constraints in, from the table? Okay. Straightforward? Yeah. Okay, so x1 has a, an ava availability of at most 75, x2 of at most 250. And the others, because they're unlimited, they would just have their usual non-negativity constraints, but nothing constraining their upper bound. So x1, x2 have upper bound constraints. The other five do not. And then lastly, the cost objective function is written in, in a way that you would expect. You'd say your problem is to minimize cost. So minimize 16 times x1 plus 10x2 plus 8x3, 9, 48, 60, and 53 using the cost coefficients. OK, so um, I chose 3 and 4%. The original values were 3 and 3.5% here in the row for you. Uh, maybe as a challenge to yourself, before you go look up Rardin's solution in GAMS, why don't you go try coding it up yourself? Right? As a way to start getting used to GAMS, you're going to have to do this for your projects. So a nice challenge for yourself is to go code up this problem, solve it, and then download Rardin's solution. Now Rardin's solution goes a little bit further than this problem. So you, you'll have to modify his source code and take out some extra constraints that he's added, and then compare your answer to his. Okay. The uh, last quick point I want to mention is right here at the bottom of the page is that blending models often have ratio constraints. So you might have a ratio between flour and sugar or butter and sugar or milk and flour if you are blending something. In this case, I've given you an example of ingredients x1 to x4 must have a ratio of 2 to 3. So we express that x1 to x4, and it says here to have a ratio of at least 2 to 3. Okay. So that's how you would code that requirement. So it says that butter must at least be 2 parts to 3 parts flour, and that ratio must be at that at a minimum. That's not linear, but we can linearize it or make it linear by bringing x4 over to the right hand side and then GAMS will internally convert that to x1 minus 2 thirds x4 greater than or equal to 0 to get it into standard form. Okay. Now the requirement of course is that you can do that on the denominator. x4 here is a non-negative variable so we can bring it over to the other side of the inequality. It's always zero or above. But in this particular case, this last example shown here, that denominator is uncertain. It could be negative or it could be positive. <coughs> and you can prove this to yourself, or you know from inequalities that bringing through a negative one multiplier or a negative sign multiplier through inequality flips the signs. So you can't go bring that x1 minus x3 over to the other side unless you're always sure that this denominator is positive. Okay? That case that I had there on the board, x4 is the amount of butter or flour. It's always a strictly positive variable. 
And so we can do that. But be careful of these situations where you're unsure of your denominator sign. Okay. So again, there are a small hint for setting up problems. So next class, then, we'll continue on with the, the last page of this handout. Please bring it back. And as I said, strongly recommended to do this for um, homework on your own. <laughs>